Hello there, welcome to Build Series. I'm HuffPost Lee Blickley, and today I will be joined by the executive producer of the hip Netflix series, 13 Reasons Why. We have Mandy Teefee here, who alongside her daughter, Selena Gomez, saw a lot of success uh, following the first season of the show. Now season two is out and captivating viewers once again with its informative storylines um, and tough storylines about teen life. Let's take a look at a clip before we bring Mandy to stage. It felt like this whole thing was going to be over. But it's not. How far does the dark go? What are you going to do about that? goes on at this school. This is proof of who they all are. The truth doesn't always make things right. It's gonna keep happening. It doesn't stop. There is nothing left worth having except justice for our daughter. on anyone else anymore. I have to do this myself. You don't. No one's gonna get justice for her. Welcome Mandy TV to the stage. Hi, thank you. Wow, thank that, you. that brought back all the feelings I had when I watched season two a few weeks ago now. Yeah. Um, let's go back to kind of the beginning of this journey with you and 13 Reasons Why. Yeah. Because you were uh, Selena's manager, and yes. then you decided, I, I'm, I think I'm going to go into the producing field. Talk about that, that decision. Actually, I was a producer in Texas, and I had my own production company, and we did mostly commercials and music videos because there was not a lot of film and TV there. And uh, I worked for a um, film festival called the Deep Ellen Film Festival that raised money for cancer patients, but we, what we did is we gave the money directly to the patients to pay for their bills to help, you know, keep the lights on and to take care of their families during the, the process instead of it, you know, there's so many organizations giving the money to research. It's like, let's give it to the people who can need it immediately right away. So um, I was producing for years and then um, Selena um, had an open call for Disney. Her dream was to be on the Disney Channel and they found her at an open call over 5,000 people and we moved there and um, I had a set sit because she was a minor and I've never not worked in my life because I had her when I was 16. And so I went to a conservatory and studied there and got her through school. And then I decided, you know, she's given this opportunity. It's her dream. As a parent, I need to support her. Scared to death, we were paycheck to paycheck. And I then just started researching material for a transition because as a Disney kid, there is no roadmap for females. You know, like Ryan Gosling did it, Shia LaBeouf did it, Justin Timberlake did it. Music's a little different with, you know, Christina and Britney, but there was no female actresses that had really set a roadmap for us to kind of use as a resource. 
And so we had to create it. And I went into Barnes and Nobles to find a book um, that someone suggested as an adaptation. And I didn't, I didn't really like it because they all still saw in the Disney mode kind of thing. And I saw the cover of this book and it was a little girl on a swing. And I stood there and I read it from cover to cover and I shut it and I called her agency. I go, where is this? She has to be a part of it and I will do whatever it takes. And Jay was actually about to close a deal with another production company that had money because we did not. And you know, you have to write that $1 check so that there's some kind of transaction. And um, Jay came and he had sushi with us and we um, convinced him we were the right people for it. And it was originally a transition piece for her to come out of the channel. And it just took so long. We sold it many times and they kept, um, I made a promise to Jay of how it was gonna come out, which is how it came out with the amazing Brian Yorkie, um, executing it beautifully. And um, and he stood by us for, for eight years. It took 10 years for it to get on the air. And it all happened for a reason, because I mean, who could see anybody but Catherine Langford playing Hannah, mm -hmm. you know? And so it, that, that was kind of the process of, how you know you had to fight to tell the truth of what our, our you know our kids go through. Yeah. How did Selena feel when she wasn't when she knew? Oh, maybe I won't be able to play this role because I'm sure after a few years of being a part of it, she probably had it in her mind um, that she was going to play Hannah and what she was going to bring to it. So was it hard for her to give up that? No, actually, it really wasn't because what we um, in the interim Spring Breakers came through, and so my mentality of mother of the year for putting their child in spring breakers um, was I was like, okay, this is um, a role with Harmony and Franco were the only ones at the time that were attached. None of the other girls were at that point. And I said, the performances that Harmony can get out of non-actors, I can only imagine what he can out of, you know, talent that that act for a living and um, we flew to Tennessee and he took down all his erotic art because he thought because she was on the Disney Channel we were hardcore Christians. <laughs> I don't understand that comparison since you know um, Walt Disney was Jewish so I don't know how you know that is Disney it you know yeah. and I'm like I'm putting my child I'm trying to get her in spring breakers I think Christianity is not in the conversation the here and yeah. and so um he I educated her on harmony and she went in and she worked with him for a couple hours and so that set up other movements for her and then she started to want to produce and um it got to the point to where like she was um in once you get into music as an actor and as talent it's a different it's a different world you're now considered a celebrity or a pop or like an icon pop culture icon and that wouldn't have been fair to these characters to put an a-list well-known actor as Hannah Hannah needed to be Hannah so she you know was very very um, thankful that we found Catherine to give life to the project that meant so much to us. So, no, there was never, it, it was, you know, I always taught her, you do what's best for the project. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what we did. Yeah, this cast is unbelievable. And again, Catherine Langford unbelievable. is so good. Unbelievable. Um, did you ever, after everything that happened with the first season, um, casting that and how how many people were talking about the cast and the show and the mm -hmm. subject line. Um, did you ever expect there to be a season two or was it something that you guys ever talked about during the production of the first season? Well, we went out to sell it as a mini series because the book was pretty much written, you know, as a series and we actually originally sold it as a feature and it didn't work because you you couldn't understand all the characters and it was just like, you didn't even like Hannah because you felt she was being mean. So we took it away a couple of times and then we shelved it and then House of Cards came out and we're like, okay, if television's going to this, let's try this. And um, we met Brian Yorkie and he got it. It was funny, I was, because I was on the phone 
his agent called and who happened to be my lit agent and said, there's this book, 13 Reasons Why. He goes, I don't care what it is. I don't know what the job is. I want it. What do you want me to do? I will be a writer's assistant. And, you know, and he won a Tony and a Pulitzer. So that was such a blessing for a YA show. And um, so it, um, it, what was your question? <laughs> I do that. Yeah, so. no, 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 it's fine. So that you what you were talking about. So I was asking, so did you know that there would be a season I, two? No, no, we didn't because we were kind of going along with it. And then we ended it to where some people might be a little upset that this didn't get, but we felt like you could come to your conclusion of what would happen and we didn't want to force it. What really kind of came to fruition of when we realized that it was important to do a season two is the response of the conversation that this was needed and wanted. And um, because when we initially went out to sell this, people were saying, kids don't want to talk about this. Kids don't want to watch this. And um, I remember they compared it to that Zac Efron movie about the sailboat. And I don't know if you remember. Or something? Oh, no, yeah. Not that. And they go, the cloud something? something like that. And they go, you know, the kids didn't relate to it. And I go, well, I don't know how many people talk to their dead brother on a sailboat. So I, I go, I understand that. I go, but they're needing this and you know I've been around it and you know seeing the letters my daughter got and all of the other cast members and all the other Disney kids I was seeing that yearning for wanting to be heard and that all that that did was prove that it was right and that they did need it and they did want it and um and I will say, and I repeatedly say, I will, I, I refuse to apologize for forcing parents to know what their children are watching and forcing parents to have conversation with their children. And um, I feel like we handed them a platform to either watch it. I won't tell you how to raise your kid, but here is something that is reality. And it may be hard to watch because it is hard to watch. You don't want your kid to be Bryce. You don't want your kid to be Hannah. Um, you don't want to be the parent that you feel like you missed and you could have saved because that's not the case all the time. It's just I knew adults were going to be the ones who had more of an issue because the kids live this every day. And um, so then we saw there's more social issues um, that these kids want to talk about it and now look at who's moving our country you know these kids with gun violence it's like it, it, it's like I'm not saying we're taking credit for that but I feel like we cracked that door a little bit like we're they're like, okay well they're gonna hear us now because they had to fight um in high schools churches are showing it and, you know, they would warn it, you know, the people that are coming in, this might not be easy to watch, but they need to see the reflection of what our society is, or we would have failed the project and the mission. Because mm -hmm. I'm one of those people that watched it, you know, in my late 20s, uh -huh. and I, I thought to myself, I kind of would have liked a show like this when I was mm -hmm. a teenager, because I thought I was you know, the only person living in this high school world and nobody was talking about the problems that maybe we talked about at school. Yeah. Uh, but then I also saw the side of the parents who were probably a little worried about what their kids were watching. Um, so did you assume that those conversations would kind of spark after the series? Which, you know, it does lend itself to, to of course, Netflix letting it be kind of a binge where you could just watch all the episodes. Mm -hmm. um, did, you, did you have a feeling that the conversation would spark immediately after season one? The funny thing is, is I, I was kind of the only one. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, after they shot it, they go, this might cause some controversy. And I'm going, you're realizing that now? Like, you know, I always expected it to, but my whole thing was if one person watched it and it changed their life, I feel like I did what I promised Jay because Jay had spent so many years walk, you know, traveling the world, helping kids understand they're not alone in this situation. And um, 
I wasn't surprised. I was ready to take it on. And um, so it, there was a lot of kind of hurry up, you know, how do, how do we make this right? How do we not, you know, dismiss the people that feel that this triggered them? We don't, that wasn't our objective at all. So that's why in second season, we respected the audience we were trying to reach and say, hey, this is an issue going on. If this is a trigger, we don't want you triggered. Um, but if you know someone going through this, maybe educate yourself, you know. Um, first season especially, every, every actor had their own counselor, um, psychiatrist, and worked through their characters. Um, Tom McCarthy worked with um, each of them two weeks on their characters. There were um, families who lost children to suicide. There were suicide... Um, um, children who attempted suicide on set consulting. We had, you know, the dogs on set. We did everything we possibly could do to make this as real and honest as possible. So when it came out and people were saying we were being irresponsible, we watched 27 suicides in um, cinematic history to make sure it wasn't glorified, it wasn't shot artistically, it wasn't gratuitous, and it wasn't honorable. Mm -hmm. And we took it very seriously. So um, I guess we had to hand feed that fact to them for the second season yeah. because that we don't we don't want to lose children. That's the point of the show. So. Yeah, because that scene is very graphic, the mm -hmm. suicide scene. And then there are some scenes now in season two towards the end yes. that have gotten the same kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. Is it too graphic? Is it too much? Or should we be showing that? Or is it good that kids are seeing that? Mm -hmm. um, what are What's your response to the critics that say maybe, you know, um, this scene was too much or maybe the gun violence was too much? Um my personal opinion is I would much rather watch the gun violence happen in a make-believe world than it happening in our real world. And um, being educated on that and learning how to discuss that with our children. Um, I might have a week off now on the dates, but I do believe at last week we had 23 school shootings and only two, 22 weeks in the year. That's Un, uncalled for mm -hmm. that that our kids you know I'm creating a charity that's a town hall and it was originally for at-risk children all our kids are at risk now mm -hmm. and so now there there is no audience it's every kid they're at risk they can't even go to school and that's upsetting and so what I said was um, and I will address the Tyler scene um, because one out of six men have been sexually assaulted at some age in their life. And for that to be dismissed is unfair to the survivors of that sexual assault simply because they're male. I don't see how that's fair, that we address it in season one with, with Hannah and Jessica, and it's kind of like, it wasn't ignored, and it was very painful to watch, but was it as surprising as what ha happened to Tyler? And I told this, um, I told one reporter who, um, there's a parent organization that's trying to now take season two off of the air, and I said, um, she said, how do you feel about that? And I go, like I said earlier, I'm not gonna apologize for that. And I go, why don't you go on YouTube and watch an actual child get raped and then tell me you know everything your child is watching because they they have this in their mind that we're putting this in these kids heads and and the suicide rate from 1999 has gone up 35% our show just came out mm -hmm. so there's no correlation to that um I personally really enjoyed season two. Um, I, I wonder how hard how hard was it for your team, you know, considering this wasn't based off a book anymore and you mm -hmm. have to kind of start from scratch. 
Um, how hard was it for your team to decide what scenes to put in, what storylines to focus on, and how to give these characters, you know, more than just the first season gave them, and, and explain how their story continues? Um, that um, season two had a lot of ups and downs because we actually received the script with the um, shooting um, the week before Vegas. And so then we had, sorry, I always hit the mic. Um, we had to have a meeting and really discuss how do, we, how do we not pull back from what our agenda is, but also not disrespect people who lost their family members in this or, or children in other school shootings because Vegas was not the first incident by any means. And so we, um, we did reshoot that, but for other reasons towards the end um, because we needed to reshape some of the characters throughout the entire season to, um, to address that in a respectable manner with still facing it head on. And um, so with that particular, that, that couldn't be ignored because that's too much right now. That, that's going on way too much. And um, with, uh, uh, what was the other, the other question? I ramble, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, uh, I just said like- Because I'm so decide? passionate and I'm filled with a lot of information. Yes. <laughs> no, because you, you know, that was the whole gun violence storyline that we good, saw. Yeah. And then you talked a little bit about Tyler's. What are some of the other, you know, storylines that you know you wanted to use these characters to kind of address through mm -hmm. the show? Well, you know, with Jessica for this sexual yeah. assault, what I really un enjoyed about where Brian took her first season was she was not the high school girl who goes back to the boyfriend because she loves him and he made a mistake. And she was very aware because we all were kind of aware that Bryce was manipulating him or was Bryce his friend? Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy who plays Bryce is the sweetest Justin. person. Yeah, have you met him? He was here on Build, but yeah. I mean, so I mean, that's a hard role to, to play. It's so hard that I look at him and I go, really? Yeah. I don't know if I want you to come into my house, but you're the most wonderful human on the planet. So you are more than welcome to come to my house. But he, you know, with him, um, he did a lot of research and it was really hard for him to, to do that. So it was, he was so, um, he was, he nailed that jock mentality of being charming is he manipulating? Did he really care for Justin? There were so many questions left with him. And I think he handled it really well um, with how he portrayed that character. And I like the fact that Jessica didn't let that be an excuse, mm -hmm. that you were my boyfriend and you were supposed to protect and love me to Justin. And... Um, a lot of high school girls or in high school students in general are still they're they're still forming their their mindset and who they are and they are vulnerable. I was that girl, you know, I was abused and I would continuously go back because I could change him and I know he loves me and he didn't mean it. And so I love the strength she had and then you see in second 2 you're like Ah, you know, but that's reality. And, you know, it's, um, I, I really did, um, I, I also loved one of my favorite things of handling that was when he was on the stand and uh, the, each girl that he feels they were honored to have sex with him are addressing him, but, you know, the whole court's not seeing it. We are seeing it, so... You know, we have. I've had a lot of girls come up to me in the mall and say, "You know, I didn't get justice, but I feel like I did. So thank you for showing the world that this happens." And they do get slap on the wrist. So, so with the the seasons, we get to see 
why did Bryce think that was okay? Why, why did Justin, you know, it's, it made them more three-dimensional and we get to hear their side of the story because their life isn't happy-go-lucky, mm -hmm. you know? And it's, you know, it, everybody has their demons and so we get to explore that more. Yeah, and the season two kind of, it kind of wraps everything up mm -hmm. and then the finale is what has people... Uh, had people talking because now we're like, wait, there's a whole nother storyline that could happen. And then, of course, it was announced that there will be a season three. Mm -hmm. which I, is everyone excited that there's going to be a season three? Because we want to know what continues. Mm -hmm. Now, where do you go from here? Uh, what are your goals with season three? Is it the same as the first two seasons? Is bringing these conversations to the teen audience that clearly is listening and wants to watch? Um, well, the the only thing that... I can give because it's the only thing I know. And I think, you know, Brian is in his, in his world really trying to grab it is, you know, um, is it's a little bit of a, a clean slate with still, you know, Hannah will not be in it, but she will be there with everybody. And we're gonna focus in on the main characters who have the social issues and um, then we are going, you know, do our continuous research of what needs to be, you know, brought up, brought to, you know, attention to the world and um, try to, you know, figure that, figure out what's important to tell because Bryce transfers to another school. What is his life like afterwards, you know? Because I will say, um, yeah, it, it, it's... Um, I know in uh, the trailer, you know, he shuts the thing, it was rapist. When season one came out, you know, there was so much controversy. They were breaking, and they thought it was my car, but it was my husband's car. They were breaking in the car, and they were spray painting Teen Killer in my car. And I don't even know how they knew where I lived, because it was a rental, because we didn't know where we were moving yet. And um, so we had to take really high security measures to protect the kids. And um, unfortunately, I was used to that because, you know, there's a lot of anger towards Disney kids. So we've been dealing with that for years. And um, so it's, um, it was very risky, but I, I, I use a quote. And it's a, little, it's a little dramatic when it comes to when I'm picking comedies that I need to add more of. So if anybody has an idea of something funny, please help me. Um, but Martin Luther King, is um, he, may, he, he said, you don't know what you're willing to stand for. You don't know what you stand for until you're willing to die for it. And... Um, I use that when I pick material because I want to, I don't want to be preachy. And that's why this, I, I feel second season did have, because of the adult characters, did come off a little bit more educational and in a way that first season was, this is a show. Because, um, interesting enough, the one scene documentary, Bully, um, anybody who was anti-bullying are the only ones going to see a documentary. So we had to make something that people, you know, kids that wouldn't go watch a documentary would have no clue what they're walking into. Yeah. yeah. Mentioned the parents, too. Kate Walsh is so phenomenal in this Oh, season. my gosh. I liked how we got to know her character a little more. But now I'm just curious about, like, Clay and what what's going to happen with Clay because we kind of saw him in a particular situation so I'm curious to see how season three goes. I mean how brilliant I mean I, I mean I can't say enough about our cast but Dylan flawless like you know they're just so flawless these we lucked out so hard I mean it was like it wasn't luck because it was six months of casting but they all read for Clay and Hannah every actor 900 actors and then we kind of re we moved him around and tried to play with it. But his first audition and Catherine's tape that she made from home, didn't even know what the book was. I, she was on my wall from the very first time. I knew she was Hannah. I was like ready for a fight. And we got the call and Netflix is like, 
ah, Catherine Langford and Dylan Minnette. I was like, oh, oh my gosh, I'm not Walter. fighting the monster, like, you know, the giant corporation here. I'm not fighting them, you know? And a lot of people are like, really, a girl who's never done anything and the kid from Goosebumps? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, really. And they're going to show you. This has definitely propelled their careers. It, yeah, definitely. So. Well, I do want to open it up to some questions from the audience before we head out. Hi. Um, Hi. I was just wondering, um, with the show out now, uh, have you ever had like uh, conversations with your kids, like maybe prior to the show, about you know like bullying and you know everything else that's been like my about? personal children? Yeah. Ye Oh, yes. Yes, definitely. Um, I grew up in, um, in um, Selena. I have a five-year-old, so the big age gap, yeah. you know, so it's different types of um, bullying. But with uh, Selena, we grew up um, paycheck, paycheck, and um, we're actually not us together, but I'm doing a documentary on nature versus nurture. And we're utilizing that on what actually really influences people um, because I was adopted, so I don't know my nature. And I only know my nurture, and that was very unbalanced. And I lost, uh, I think, with Christina Grimmie, um, from seven, I lost 37 um, family members or friends to suicide, violence, or overdose. And that was in the 90s. And so what I did, because I didn't have this, is um, we would watch Intervention, me and Selena, about drug abuse. And then we would watch other stuff. And I'm like, look, that wasn't nice, and this is why. And I would actually take her to schools, like um, the high school I grew up in, because there's police officers all there, and they all remember me, and they're like, oh, what are you doing here, you know? And Because I wasn't an angel. You know, I cleaned up my, my, my shit when I got pregnant at 16. But, um, and, but beforehand, uh, she would go in, and she would, you know, we would talk about it. And you, you do, you just, like, be a better person and treat people the way that you want to be treated. And I, I say this to the to this day, I, I walk around talking about how you treat people, and I can promise you if I wore a camera, I would probably catch 10 to 15 things that I did that was shitty, and I would regret that, why did I do that to that person? Is that going to affect them? And I'm not saying we're all going to be perfect. That's, Im that's impossible, because we're all from different worlds and different cultures, but it's as something as easy as, like, really thinking about how you're gonna affect someone with an action that you make. So, um, yeah, no, it's it's definitely a conversation that um, I can't, I have to practice what I preach. Mm -hmm. Mike can't be a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more, I think, here we go. We're gonna take our last question from an online viewer. Okay. Rachel wants to know, what's your best memory of being on set of 13 Reasons Why? Oh, there were so many. Um, I think my, well, this is going to sound weird, but my, um, my best memory was the very last day of shooting in season two. Because you would think it was season one where we were all like crying and upset, but we knew what we did was incredible. So that whole season was just amazing. But I had... I got cold and I went to a thrift store and I bought this $4 coat that came down to here, had fur around it, and gold and blue and green dollar bills. And um, there's that dance scene in the high school and they were shooting another scene and me and the other producers were delirious because we were on the martini the very last shot and we shot a rap video where, um, I was I was rapping and dancing, <laughs> and um, that was my favorite memory because it's awful. We had no business doing it, but the coat is pimp, <laughs> and I and you have to see it. Like I'm gonna post it, so later on you guys go check out my Instagram, and in that that was one of my favorite one of my favorite moments because I think we at that at that point we were like. 
Yeah. We did make second season and, you know, because it was a lot of ups and downs. So really didn't have to do with the show. It was kind of a personal embarrassing moment. We'll be looking for Mandy like the pop icon, right? Uh, no, 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 no. No. <laughs> well, no talent here in that field whatsoever. Well, you do have talent because you produced a great show and it's out now. It's streaming on Netflix if you guys haven't watched it yet. And thank you so much for being here, Mandy. Oh my gosh, we love having you. Thank you for having me. I am obsessed with your building. Oh my oh. gosh. <laughs> I made it myself. <laughs> I'm like, did you? <laughs> well, thank you. And thank you guys for coming and, you know, it's hanging in there with me when I derail because that's a big problem of mine. Yeah, I like to tell stories. <laughs> thank you, Mandy. Thanks, yes, guys. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.